I'm going to give a kind of a generic hyponatremia talk. I'm not going to focus specifically on neurologic stuff. I'll point out the neurologic stuff. I think it's imp more important to sort of understand hyponatremia in general. If you don't understand it, it's really hard to focus on the particulars of it. So I, I think it'll be good. Hopefully it'll be informative. I don't know if it'll be good. But uh, <laughs> I can't say it's interesting. That's why I'm a surgeon, because I don't think it's interesting that much. <laughs> but anyway, um, we'll make it as good as we can. Anyway. Um, We'll talk about a couple different things. We'll define it, talk about um, how often we see it, where we see it, a little bit on physiology and pathophysiology, talk about the types, um, um, clinical manifestations, how we diagnose it, how we treat it. The key to hyponatremia really is understanding there's basically really three different types, and I'll, and I'll go through this a couple times. And what type of hyponatremia is dependent on the patient's volume status. So if they're volume depleted, if they're euvolemic or normal volume status, or if they have high volume status or, or you know, water retention. And that defines the kind of hyponatremia you have, it defines the treatment. So, um, talk about it. So, normal serum concentration, it's a little bit different. Every lab you use, we'll use 135 uh, here to define the lower limit of normal. That's most labs. Um, and it's important to understand that hyponatremia represents a relative excess of water in relation to sodium, meaning that this is a concentration. So it's how much sodium you have per how much water you have, okay? It's not your total sodium, it's not your total water, okay? Just a concentration. Just like hematocrit is, a, is an indicator of the concentration of red blood cells. So if you have a low blood volume, you'll have less total blood cells in someone with the same hematocrit that has a higher blood volume. It's just a concentration of blood cells, concentration of sodium, okay? So it's the most common electrolyte disorder. You see it in a lot of patients, especially hospitalized patients. Um, in surgical patients, um, almost 5%. And in patients that are in the intensive care unit, can be as high as 30%, like Melissa said. It's very common. So um, things we worry about. What are the, the bad things with? So again, nervous system can tolerate things happening slowly. So patients. Patients can get sodiums as low as 115, 114, 113, very slowly and almost look normal, okay? Acutely, if they go from 135 to 120, they're going to look very abnormal, okay? So the nervous system handles slow processes very well. It does not handle acute processes as well, okay? Um, and in patients with a sodium, this says 105, I think, Anything less than 110 is something we looked at as a real emergency. Anything below 115 is a very urgent problem, um, especially, and anything below 120 acutely is an urgent problem. So, chronic hyponatremia, like I said, um, developing more than, over more than what they classify more than 48 hours, um, it's less of a problem because the body's and the brain's able to accommodate make more proteins, get rid of proteins, increase its osmotic pressure so it can regulate how much water it has in the cells. So the danger with all this, there's two real dangers. The dangers is brain swelling, spinal cord swelling, brain swelling, okay? And, and basically what happens is that there is a relative increase in the osmolality or the concentration of electrolytes, sodium being the most important one, in the brain cells relative to the blood cells. And so, what happens is that water from the blood cells goes into the brain cells to make the water content the same. And when that happens, it can't get rid of sodium fast enough, and those cells expand. And that's why people get cerebral edema. So what all it is is the water from the blood rushing into the brain cells to equal the pre osmotic pressure on both sides of the cell membrane. It's that simple, OK? Um, we see it in all age groups. So it's really common in infants that come into the pediatrician in the water who've had like a GI bug and their parents, instead of giving them Pedialyte, they give them tap water. And that's a really common cause of hyponatremia. Uh, these kids are having diarrhea, they're having um, em emesis, and then they replace that relatively normal plasma sodium concentration of those fluids with a very a zero sodium concentration or almost zero concentration sodium in water, in tap water. Um, Sometimes elderly patients with a diminished sense of thirst, um, especially when they can't get to food or water, is another age group you see it in. Um, so how do we regulate our 
sodium concentration. So to understand how to fix it, we sort of have to have a little bit of background on how the body normally regulates sodium in the healthy person. So it's done a couple ways. Um, the stimulation of thirst, the secretion of ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone. So it's an antidiuretic. So it's a hormone that causes you to retain water. An antidiuretic hormone is a hormone that causes you to retain water. So if there's more ADH, you're retaining more water. Okay? So it's a double negative. If you have less ADH, you're getting rid of more water. Okay? Um, the big thing, and we'll talk about this and I'll show you this, is what's called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So renin angiotensin aldosterone system are important uh, for patients that take care of cardiac patients um, um, and um, very common in the management of um, um, sodium regulation. And then obviously the kidneys who handle the, fo the filtered sodium, how the sodium, if the kidneys are not working normally, it's very difficult to can be very difficult to regulate sodium, or if the kidneys aren't seeing enough of the blood flow, it can be difficult to regulate sodium. So what, when we get thirsty, um, it's a result of our serum osmolality, so the, the density of the electrolytes in our, the concentration or density of electrolytes in our system um, going up. And this is very sensitive, so it only requires about a two or three percent increase. So you get dehydrated, you sweat, you go out, you work out, you sweat, you get thirsty. You get thirsty because the body, the brain, senses that your concentration of electrolytes is higher than normal, and that's why you get thirsty. Okay? So that thirst causes you to drink water. Obviously, if you drink salt water, that doesn't help the problem because that has the same concentration, or if not higher, than your body. And that's why if you drink salt water, it's bad. If you drink tap water or bottled water that doesn't have that same increase, that's how the body drives you to... Um, re-regulate your um, concentration. So it dilutes the, your plasma osmolality or your concentration with tap water. That's all you're doing when you get thirsty. The other way you can do it, if you lose blood or your blood volume goes down, like in shock, um, that's another way to do it, but that's less sensitive. So, oop. so in shock, all right, what did I do here? In shock, you really don't see a change in um, sodium regulation um, until or stimulation of thirst until your blood volume or pressure uh, goes down 10 or 15 percent. Uh, thirst centers is located in the hypothalamus um, and it responds to sodium chloride is in a form of uh, concentration of sodium chloride like we talked about. It also responds to a, 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 um, a protein that's made um, through the body called angiotensin, angiotensin 2 and we'll talk about that. So uh, antidiuretic hormone, or the hormone that causes you to retain water, okay, is synthesized um, in the brain, uh, in the hypothalamus, by two, in two areas, the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nuclei, okay? What does ADH, ADH do? So ADH triggers, um, is triggered by a change of about 1%, like we talked about, um, and that causes changes in both the volume and pressure of the vascular system, okay? Um, and what does it do? It increases the permeability of the collecting duct, which is part of the, what's called the loop of Henle. It's a part of the cells, an apparatus, multicellular apparatus in the kidneys that there's millions of. So there's a little apparatus that the water, your blood's filtered through, and it makes the long ducts in the kidney, that the filtering mechanisms, more permeable to water. So it allows more water to come in and more, relatively more sodium to leave, okay? So this is renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, okay? Um, renin, which is um, um, it's stimulated by perfusion pressure, it's stimulated by sympathetic activity, and stimulated by sodium chloride delivery to the macula densa, which is another part of the kidney, okay? Increasing the sodium chloride delivery to the kidney um, by GFR, which is glomerular filtration rate, okay? Um, um, is actually decreased by the renin secretion. I'll t and I'll explain this. I have a sh couple slides to show you this. Um, the, other, the other thing we see here is aldosterone, which is a hormone, okay? It's made um, in the adrenal gland. It's made in the outside layer of the adrenal gland. And 
aldosterone has similar effects. It reduces um, sodium's excretion in that area called the loop of Henle, that little part of the kidney, um, and stimulates its reabsorption. At the same time, it gets rid of potassium, okay? So um, certain diuretics work by, certain drugs work by limiting these functions, and that's why when you give things like Lasix, you worry about supplementing it with potassium because it gives you this, the way those drugs work is they cause an excess loss of potassium, and that's why you have to supplement those type of drugs, okay? Um, and this works in the distal tubule, the ascending loop of Henry, and also in the collecting duct. Those are all parts of this little uh, glomerulus, this little part of the kidney. Okay, this is a, uh, this is aldosterone here. This is the, this is the, the whole um, collecting tubule and the loop, and there's millions of these within the kidney, okay? Um, and each of these is a little filtration system on its own, and your whole blood volume goes through at least one of these in the kidney. Um, so aldosterone works in these parts, ADH works in this part, um, and then certain, like I said, certain um, of different diuretics work in different areas, like, like Lasix works here um, in the distal loop of Henle. But they all work in different places, so we'll go through that. Um, so, so in your body, your extracellular fluid, so your fluid outside the cells, is about 40% of your total fluid, and the intracellular fluid in the cells is about 60%. So it's almost 50-50 cells outside cells, okay? Um, the, your kidneys have enough function to get rid of about 15 to 20 liters a day, okay, in healthy kidneys. So it would be very difficult to overpower your kidneys just by your drinking or sodium intake, okay? for healthy kidneys, for obviously for unhealthy kidneys, that's obviously not the case, okay? And like I said, sodium is the predominant osmo or the thing that's contributing to the extracellular fluid compartment and your osmolality, the concentration, because it's the largest um, concentration. If you look at like sodium as a concentration, it's like 135, potassium is like five or six or four or three, right? Um, so, like I said, hyponatremia can really only occur when something happens with this normal process. Um, so, in an acute drop in the serum osmolality, so if the sodium level goes down, like we said, neuro neuronal swelling can occur uh, due to the water shift from the extracellular space to the intracellular space. That swelling causes two responses. It slows down antidiuretic hormone secretion, okay? So, if you, if you reverse reversing diuretic, so double negative diuretic, it's now diuretic. So it's causing it to inhibit the antidiuretic, which means it acts as a diuretic to get rid of water. So you have swelling, it inhibits the antidiuretic and causes you to, to try to pee off this extra volume, okay? And that's the immediate cellular adaption to, to that. So this is just, this is a really nice overview of this system. And it's the whole body. So this system's working in every major organ system, okay? Every blood vessel, lungs, kidney, even the heart actually comes in because part of this is now, this is an older slide, but um, atrial natriuretic peptide, um, 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 which we have drugs now that we can use to treat, um, like for heart failure patients, uh, is part of this as well. But the, the, simple, the simple thing is, so the precursor um, to this system is uh, angiotensinogen. Angiotensinogen is cleaved by renin, to make angiotensin 1, and then the angiotensin converting enzyme in the lungs, in the capillary walls of the lungs, it converts angiotensin 1 to the active form, which is angiotensin 2. Okay? That works, that has the biggest areas of effect. Angiotensin 2 causes increased sympathetic activity, so it increases tone. Okay? It increases reabsorption, so this is urine, this is urine sodium going back into the body, this is potassium leaving the body. Okay? Increases sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion, and the H2O follows the sodium. See, this is dotted, which means the H2O is following the sodium out back into the body. Um, the angiotensin II causes aldosterone secretion, which does similar things, so it's a positive feedback. Aldosterone does the same thing. It increases so sodium absorption and potassium secretion. At the same time, that angiotensin converses the arterioles to constrict, uh, increasing your blood pressure. Okay, um, so um, um, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin ACE inhibitor class of drugs, works here for blood pressure control. It stops the cleavage of angiotensin one to angiotensin two, and thereby decreasing vasoconstriction and lowering blood pressure. Okay, so 
Um, and the other thing that we talked about is angiotensin II is a positive feedback. And along with local things like increasing in thirst mechanism and the osmolality receptors that we talked about, that also causes um, ADH secretion by the posterior lobe of the pituitary. The posterior lobe of the pituitary is connected to the hypothalamus, which is sitting right here, right above it, which is where those supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei are that sense um, ADH in changes in your osmolality. So this is a far-reaching system. This is your whole body is involved um, in this because it's a really important process to maintain normal water function, normal um, sodium function, depending on what you're doing and what's happening to you. So like I said, more, more, more important than the physiology. The physiology is, is actually fairly complicated, and it's good to understand the terms because you can at least see where these drugs act. But I think more important is to kind of break up the pathologic practices. So I kind of like to think of this. There's five categories here, but there's really only three. There's hypovolemic hyponatremia, euvolemic, and hypervolemic hyponatremia. Um, almost all of our patients um, um, fall into this category or this category. Um, almost all the other patients in the hospital fall into this category, and you'll, I'll show you. Um, I'll talk about these two as well, but they're, they're not even important to, to remember. They're important to mention. Um, so this is hypovolemic hyponatremia. This is going to be the most common thing you see outside the hospital and the most common thing you see in the neurosurgical patients. Um, this develops as sodium and free water are both lost, but free water is lost more so than sodium. Okay. So if you lose the same amount of sodium and the same amount of water, all you do is get euvolemic. You don't get hyponatremic. You just get dehydrated. Okay? Um, so the sodium can be lost either through urine, through the kidneys, or it can be lost through non-renal routes. So non-renal routes, working out, like we talked about, um, emesis, right? diarrhea, fistulas that are draining, um, drains, post-op drains that are draining, Pancreatitis is a, is a way of people losing things. Anybody that's um, excessive sweating. Some people that are having third spacing of fluids, so people who have liver failure that have ascites, or people that have peritonitis with large fluid reserves in the abdomen or in their peritoneal space. Um, and also burn patients who have, no, you know, the skin's not intact, so they're losing um, free water that way. So. Uh, although we won't see that here, it's another big loss of patients. The big thing we'll see in us, this is always all of our patients, um, and, and there's one caveat to it, but we see what's called cerebral salt wasting. Nobody really quite understands this, but for some reason, um, when people have cranial pathology, especially around the time of a craniotomy or manipulation of any of the intracranial structures, they tend to lose sodium in the urine, with, even with normal kidneys, in excess of the water they're losing. Nobody really understands why that happens, um, but it's really unique. Stroke patients get it. Uh, people that are ha have brain tumors get it. Patients with ruptured aneurysms, it's very common. It's basically all the patients that you see in a neuro ICU, um, head injuries, um, lose salt in relation to water. Um, and um, um, the only other thing that we, s we see in some of the neurologic patients are, are something else that I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and, and the really simple, the great thing about this is if you give them back salt, it corrects. So if people are awake, we let them eat potato chips. We let them we eat, put as much salt on their food as they want. We let them, and people that are not as awake, we, we give them hypertonic fluids. We give them salt tabs um, through a duo tube or through an NG tube. But it's really simple to fix, and the big part is just monitoring it. Okay? And the other big part is just how quickly it corrects. Typically, these are patients that lose sodium pretty slowly. Um, so when I mean slowly, like over a day, two days, three days, you'll see it dropping down. It's not like it's happening in a 12-hour period. Okay? Whereas somebody like, with like DI, diabetes insipidus, or somebody with syndrome of ADH, they may, that may start pretty rapidly. Okay? These patients have surgery. They come back to the ICU. They have a sodium 137. Four hours later, it's 131. Eight hours later, it's 126, 127. You know, so you have time to correct these patients. So um, as, as long as you keep on it, it, it's usually not so much of an issue. Um, and then the other thing is patients with, with, who are losing uh, through renal loss, the most common cause is either is some type of renal insufficiency where the kidney can't properly reabsorb sodium or, or diuretics, which are preferentially, yeah, preferentially losing free water over um, electrolytes. 
So, okay, here's our three categories, okay? So euvolemic hyponatremia. Uh, these are patients that have normal sodium stores, okay, and an excess of free water. Okay, so this is our second category, okay? So these are patients with um, normal sodium, okay? So the first category is low sodium. Second category is normal sodium but higher water, okay? And, and the most common thing we see this in is um, either patients that have got a lot of IV fluids that are relatively hypotonic, like lactated ringers. Does anybody know what the sodium concentration of lactated ringers is? It's 130. So if you just give somebody, if you take somebody off of um, PO intake and you put them on lactated ringers, their automatically sodium will go down just from the lactated ringers, okay? Normal saline, does anybody know what normal saline is? It's one, 154. So if you give somebody normal saline, it's going to go up a little bit. And I'll, and I'll show you how to, how to figure that out. Um, but the other patients you see it in, and this, and this is common, um, is uh, patients who get uh, psychogenic polydipsia, which is a not common problem, but not uncommon in psychiatric patients. Um, you've seen like schizophrenic who smoke a lot. They do repetitive tasks. There are others that drink water. They'll just drink water. And that's, you'll see this. And then you restrict their free water. They have normal kidney function. They get rid of all the water through their urine, and the problem corrects itself. But it can be just as dangerous because they can actually drink so much that they're not, their kidneys can't keep up. But these are people that are drinking 10, 12, 15, 20 liters of water a day. Yeah. So, beer drinkers who drink 24 k ounces a day don't typically get it because sodium concentration in beer is a lot higher. So, you see chronic alcoholics will drink a case of beer a day, and it's the same amount of volume, but the sodium is a little bit higher. So, you don't really have the same problem. Um, and we talked about infants. Um, the other thing, um, bowel prep. So I have a little old lady who weighs 85 pounds and they get a normal sized bowel prep. They can actually get this just from the fluids from the bowel prep. So especially if you're using an NG tube or a duo tube to give it. Um, so you just have to be a little bit careful there. So the other category that we see as, as neurosurgeons uh, taking care of patients is this is a syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. So this is ADH which is being produced somewhere in the body that's not being fed back. So it's just producing this hormone without a normal feedback. So nothing's turning it off, okay? So it's, it's producing inappropriate amounts of antidiuretic hormone, okay? So if you're producing too much antidiuretic hormone, okay, these are the effects you're gonna have. Where we see this, um, is in, and, and basically what this does is it sort of resets your thermostat um, for sodium at a lower level than it should be because this stuff's being produced by some other exogenous source. Where we see it, sometimes um, it's an oncologic effect of people with small cell carcinoma. Uh, you can see it in people with pneumonia, you can see it in TB, you can see it in patients with sarcoid. Um, occasionally people who have strokes will get it, temporal arteritis, meningitis, or encephalitis. These are more inflammatory type problems if you look at these, except for stroke. Um, and so the straightforward head injuries, things like that, it's these patients when, when we're trying to figure out, well, it's an encephalitis patient, it's a meningitis patient, do they have salt wasting or do they have SIADH? And that's the big diagnosis that we're trying to figure out. Um, a couple different medications can do it as well, SSRIs. Uh, it's really common for people that have um, SSRIs to have low sodium when they go to the doctor, and if they stop the SSRI, it goes away. So. Uh, okay, so this is the, the most common other category is hypervolemic hyponatremia. Um, these are people that have some other pathologic condition, um, and it's, it's very common in patients with acute or chronic renal failure. It's very common in people with cirrhosis. It's very common in people with congestive heart failure or nephrotic syndrome, where they don't have the density of protein in their blood um, to be able to keep this stuff in, okay? And they get puffy, they get a lot of capillary leakage, um, and, and it's really common uh, in these people. And these are people that can't, their normal organs can't handle sodium effectively. This is what they call redistributive hyponatremia. This is, this is basically, um, in patients with, it's not really hyponatremia. What it is is that the either hyperglycemia, the most common thing is hyperglycemia, 
or mannitol. They have such a high osmotic effect that it affects the value of the lab test. Okay, so what you have to do, and I'm sure you guys have seen this, is, is people that, now the lab does it automatically for a lot of people. What they do is, if you're so, if you're, if you're, glucose is outside the normal range, they will actually correct it, give you a corrected value of the sodium for your glucose. So nowadays it's not so much an issue, and every lab's a little bit different, um, but, but internists and, and people like nephrologists will calculate it themselves, and, and, but it's really not hyponatremia. It's really just the, the way um, the sodium is handled inside the little thing that goes to the lab. And then the last thing is these are the same thing. This is the same thing happening by excess protein or lipids. So this occurs in hypertriglyceridemia and multiple myeloma with a lot of proteins that shouldn't be there floating around the cell, floating around the uh, extracellular space. I wouldn't worry about those. Um, so most people that have, whether acute or chronic, most people that are above 125, normal, okay? Acutely developing hyponatremia, they start to get symptomatic probably around 120. Um, most abnormal findings on physical exam, usually headache, confusion, those kind of things are the first things to present. Um, and um, they can either be hypovolemic or hypervolemic. So a lot of times in the ICU, these are patients that would get um, catheters to look at their uh, right heart pressures to see if they were low or high to try to help make a diagnosis. I think that people have gotten away from that more recently and, and use laboratory testing more to help figure that out. Uh, so a lot of times, once these people are, are neurologically not normal, a lot of them go down and get CT scans. They may get an EKG to look for an arrhythmia. Um, they may get a chest x-ray to look for um, collapsed lung or uh, for um, um, pneumonia, things like that. Uh, um, oftentimes, we will just repeat their sodium level to make sure it's truly abnormal. We'll correct it for hypoglycemia, like we talked about. Um, and then we order lab tests, and these are the things we're going to get. So we're going to get a plasma osmolality, which is basically just a indication of how concentrated the blood plasma is. Okay, um, we're going to get we get all of them. A urine osmolality, a concentration of the urine. Okay, we're going to get a urine sodium concentration, so a urine specific for sodium, and we're going to get a urine uric acid level. And oftentimes people will. This is something that also the lab does now, but this is a fractional excretion of sodium. It's a lab test to try to figure out how much salt is being removed by the kidneys, okay? All right, so first thing we look at, we look at plas plasma osmolality. Um, if, if the plasma osmolality is less than 275, okay, so this is where all our patients should fall. Okay, this is where all our patients are going to be. Okay, at that point, we're going to go to our tree and look at their volume status. Okay, if for whatever reason they're in one of these categories, we need to look for correcting for hypoglycemia. If a patient got a lot of mannitol somewhere else before they got to the hospital, uh, if they have a real high triglyceride or lipid level, or if they have things like multiple myeloma, which would give them a real high proteinemia in their blood. So these are the kind of pseudo hyponatremia things that we talked about, these two. And then this is all the other patients. This is going to be most of our patients are going to be in here. Okay. So as soon as we know the plasma level is normal, okay, these are these are really high. Okay. As soon as we know the plasma osmolality is on the normal level, okay. Now we're going to evaluate our volume status. So we're going to go back to our three li different levels. Okay. If they have increased volume, okay. So if they have their their lungs are wet, um, they're um, you know, got a lot of water retention, things like that. They have a high central venous pressure, high right arterial filling pressure, um, or left, inter left arterial filling pressure. Um, they're going to be those patients that are in heart failure, cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, renal dysfunction, okay? So those are the patients with increased water, okay? If they're euvolemic, those are going to be our SIADH patients, our hypothyroid, psychogenic polydipsia, uh, this is beer plutomania included, but but um, um, those are going to be our people that have normal volume status. And the decreased volume status, like we talked about, those are going to be the people that are the GI loss, the skin losses, burn patients, third spacing, people with big peritoneal um, ascites, um, people on diuretics, or for our patients, the cerebral salt wasting patients.
okay? The head injury, post-craniotomy, um, salt-wasting patients, okay? So how do we figure out which is which, okay? So now we look at the urine concentration, okay? We looked at the plasma concentration. Now we're going to look at the urine concentration, okay? Um, so if it is high, meaning it is concentrated, okay? Um, it's either one of the things, the pseudo hyponatremia that we talked about, hyperlipidemia, hyperproteinemia, hyperglycemia, or SIADH, okay? If it is low, it's from losing fluid. Does that make sense? Okay, and on that list is SIADH, is uh, cerebral salt wasting, which is what we're concerned about, but all these common things as well, okay? So we looked at plasma osmolality. We've only looked at two tests so far. Plasma osmolality and urine osmolality, and we've gotten it broken down to um, where this could be, okay? The third thing we look at is that serum concentration, I mean, excuse me, the urine concentration of sodium. So we looked at the plasma concentration of all the electrolytes, we looked at the urine concentration of all the electrolytes, now we're looking at the urine concentration of sodium, okay? If it's high, okay? It's SIADH or diuretics. If you're not on diuretics, it's SIADH, okay? If it's low, it's everything else. The other things, the uric acid level helps to confirm the diagnosis of SIADH. Fractional excretion of sodium helps to understand how the, what kidney functions, whether the kidneys, pre-renal meaning the kidneys are getting enough blood volume. Um, if somebody has like renal artery stenosis, that's a pre-renal problem, meaning not enough blood flow is getting to the kidneys, or an actual renal cause, meaning there's something wrong with the kidney itself. So if you have low blood pressure, you'll see people that have cardiac arrest, and they'll go into uh, kidney dysfunction after their cardiac arrest. That's a pre-renal source. They're just, the kidneys were fine, they just didn't get enough blood. If they have renal artery stenosis, the kidneys were fine, they just weren't getting enough blood flow, okay? Versus a renal cause, like there's an injury to the kidney, okay? Um, so... When we treat this, now we know how to find out what it is. When we treat it, uh, a couple different things. Uh, obviously, whether the patient's asymptomatic or symptomatic, uh, whether they're acute problem, chronic problem, and what their volume status is. So there's a little bit more than what we need to do, I think, but um, we'll just take you through this one time. The way you figure out how quickly somebody is going to get corrected based on what fluids you're going to give them is to basically take how, good, how much water they have, okay? This is... That's the formula. Um, and then you decide how quickly you want to correct them, okay? Um, does anybody know what the, uh, we worry about when we correct sodium too quickly? Like, why don't we correct sodium too quickly? Yeah, so, so that is uncommon, but it does happen. And when it happens, it's an it's a untreatable, horrible condition. And so um, really we're looking to, um, it depends on how low they are and how quickly they got there. Um, for people that got there quickly, you can correct them more quickly. For people that got there slower, you correct them slower, okay? So um, in general, you want to correct them sort of at the same rate that they, the, the problem happened. So if it happened over six weeks, you really want to correct them slowly. If it happened over two days, you can correct them much more quickly, okay, in general. So um, we're talking about 8 to 10 milliequivalents in 4 to 8 hours. So uh, basically, their sodium is 125, you can bring it back to normal in eight hours or four hours, and that's usually fine. Um, the people that get central pontine myelinolitis, there's no hard and fast formula for it or how quickly, but if you're correcting more than 10 to 15 mil equivalents in an hour or two hours, those are the patients that you're typically at risk for that. Okay, so this is eight to 10 and four to eight. That would be 10 to 15 in one or two. So it'd be like somebody that has a sodium of 110, that you put a bag of 3% saline into them and infuse it quickly. Those are the patients that are going to get in trouble, okay? Um, for chronic hyponatremia, obviously slower rates. All right, so, all right, so th this is how quickly giving a certain amount of volume, depending on what the volume is, is going to change this. And, and this is not stuff I think you need to worry about. but but how quickly it'll change, and it, it changes every time you, you do it, too. So, um, and, and I think most of the doctors do not go through this. They have a, an idea of how quickly, based on experience, things will change, and they monitor it so frequently now. Um, but how quickly your sodium level will change, okay, if you take the 
sodium and the potassium that's in the infusion. So these are the ions that make up the osmolality. It's pretty, pretty simple, okay? Minus what your cerium sodium is. So that gives you the change of the two fluids, the difference in the two fluids. Meaning lactated ringers would be like 154 plus is it 30 of potassium uh, minus your cerium sodium divided by your total body water plus one, okay? And that gives you what, um, what one liter of that is gonna change, okay? So, so one liter of lactated ringers contains 130 milliequivalents of sodium, 109 of chloride, 28 of lactate, and four of potassium. So if you add the potassium and the sodium together, it's 134, okay? For sodium, it's 154, a negligible potassium. For 3%, it's 514. So you can see how much more concentrated the sodium is in 3% than lactated ringers. So, okay, 60, 60 kilogram woman with a plasma sodium of 110, which is obviously low, okay? Um, I'm just gonna put these up here a second. So if you multiply 60 times 0.6, you're gonna get 36. If you round down to 30, round it up to 40, just to keep it easy. Um, and you plug that in, okay, for um, normal saline, you're going to get um, 1.4 milliequivalent increase from a liter of sodium. So you're talking about a very small change for a liter of, so of sodium. So, so you're either going to have to give this patient a lot of normal saline or you're going to have to use something more concentrated or you're going to have to take away free water, okay, with like things like diuretics, okay. So you can do both. You can either give something or you can take free water away to increase the sodium, okay? Do one more, then it's more than I can handle. <laughs> so this is a bigger guy, same sodium level, total body water is going to be faster, but now we're going to give them 3%, okay? So it's 54 and then, so now, now you're looking at, well now if you give 3%, Okay, that's going to take him up to 117. Okay, what did we say? How quickly do we want to increase people's sodium by? Approximately. We talked about, say, 8 to 10 milliequivalents max in a 4 to 8 hour period, right? So this is going up by how much? Say 8. Round it up. Say it's going to go up 8. Okay, so if it's a liter of saline, you got to make that liter bag last 8 hours. 48 hours, right? So that's a thousand. That means 250 cc's a liter to go in over four hours or 125 cc's over eight hours, right? So that's why you, that's why 3% is so common because it works out to a 70 kilogram person for about the right amount to increase at the right amount at a reasonable fluid rate. Does that make sense? So that's why it's not 2.5% or 4% or that's why the math is not that important because the fluids come in the kind of right concentrations. Um, so SIDH is the one thing that's a little bit different. So this is now, there's something, usually a tumor cell or something else, some other pathologic process, pneumonia, that's creating extra ADH, okay? Um, and in those patients, giving um, saline may actually make the problem worse. So how is this treated, okay? So if you give these patients sodium, it can actually make it worse. Um, so almost always treated by water restriction first, okay? That usually fixes it. Second thing is giving those patients salt tabs. The, the third thing, and one of the more common things for more chronic SIADH, is to give them demoxycycline. It's a type of tetracycline antibiotic that, for whatever reason, uh, people found blocks the action of antidiuretic hormone at the level of the kidney. So it doesn't take away the SIADH, that the uh, ADH that's extra that's there, it just blocks it. Okay, so it's, so it's used on a more chronic, and that takes a while, so you're not going to see that in hospital management. People may get started on it, but the main treatment is going to be fluid restriction in the hospital. Okay? What else? That's all I got. That's enough hyponatremia. Um, what, what questions can I answer? Anything? Too much? Not enough. How would you determine the total body volume? 0.6 times a person's weight. Yeah. 
But like I said, the reason that so the reason that these formulas are not used a lot is because normal saline has a concentration of 154 for a reason. Lactated ringers has a concentration of 130 because they're just under or just over what normal body sodium is. So if you're relatively hyponatremic, most people are using normal saline. If you're relatively hypernatremic, you're using lactated ringers or half normal saline or quarter normal saline or, you understand what I'm saying? 3% saline for people with, to correct acute so salt loss or acute hyponatremia because at a reasonable flow of fluid rate, you know, there's only a certain range we can give people fluids at, right, without it being a challenge. You can't give it too slow, you can't get too fast, so you have to make the concentration pretty equal. Now, what you do get in trouble is if you give 3% sodium to someone your size and someone my size at the same rate, it may be way too much for you and maybe not enough for me. You know what I'm saying? So, so you know, and if you infuse it at 50 cc's an hour versus 150 cc's an hour, it's a three times difference still. So, so that's where um, those, the, the formulas start to, I think, be important. But for a 70 kilogram person, the 3% at 70 or 80 cc's an hour is about the perfect amount to raise it about 10 mil equivalents over a 48 hour period. So. Do you guys use a lot of mannitol with your training on these? Like I, I used to work on a full. Yeah, I mean, if you if you're years ago, they used a lot for the brain swelling. Yeah, I, um, for patients with brain tumors, um, if they're started on steroids early, typically you don't use a lot of mannitol. If they're more urgent stuff, people will use mannitol perioperatively. Um, but mannitol is a short-term thing anyway. It only lasts for 24, 48 hours. Its effectiveness kind of goes away as the permeability to the mannitol stop, you know, starts, so it can equalize itself. Um, and uh, so we might give a dose or two doses, but probably not enough to cause these kind of problems. But at a trauma center, you might see somebody on it for three or four days, and then you definitely will see that these problems with it. You know, somebody with an acute head injury that's being managed for high ICP with. Uh, with mannitol, but we're using it mainly for acute swelling for, for tumor work, yeah, or for sub, you know for clipping an aneurysm that ruptured things like that. And you probably shouldn't see too much of that. So for the nurses, um, giving the salt test, and so a lot of these nurses might not have done that before. How do you order that? Is it a one gram every six? I can't remember. Yeah, we either we either one or two tabs every six or eight hours, something like that. Is is um, and and once we get an idea of how the salt corrects them, how much it corrects them, then we try to order more salt less frequently, like two tabs a day or one tab every 12 hours. So as we get more comfortable, we'll give a higher dose on a less frequent basis. And as people are awake, the effects of the salt wasting, they tend to correct it themselves. As long as you make it available for them, like salt on their food and potato chips and things like that, they'll usually, they're, because they have normal thirst and they have normal um, functioning, the rest of their systems are functioning, it will make up for that. It's the patients that are not able to have free access to PO intake that it becomes more of an issue with salt tabs or for whatever reason don't. Like they're a little goofy and they just, they can't get enough of something. You know, but people, when people are normal, like awake and talking, it's usually not so much an issue. So by the time they leave the hospital or leave rehab, it's usually not so much an issue when they go home. It's usually just when they're in the hospital or maybe when they get to rehab for the first week or two. Also, I mean, I've heard you say free water. A lot of times, we have patients on the floor that have low sodium and doctor and fluid restriction. I think that it's important that you stress that, that it's free water that needs to be restricted, not necessarily the juices and stuff. That yeah, well, like other electrolytes in them, because a lot of times they'll write fluid restriction. The people for water restriction, people are still giving them glasses of water and stuff. But that's what washes out, just like the probably gives you. Know, say it again. Say it again. The free water restriction. Right. Yeah, so, I'm, so if, you're, if you're drinking things like um, Gatorade, um, how do your guys do it here? Do they differentiate between, do they use certain fluids for those patients, or they just restrict everything? Sorry, they restrict everything. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the more common thing to do because trying to figure out, most of those products are pretty low osmotic. For, I mean, even the sports drinks, they're pretty much water. I mean, they have a little potassium, a little sodium in it, but they're water. I mean, they're just water. So... I mean, they generally restrict all fluid, and most people get enough fluid in the food they're eating anyway, because most of the food that they're eating is water anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mostly, by weight, it's mostly water. Um, so they really restrict them to, you know, half liter, a liter a day for most folks. Um, and it is free water, but you're getting, relatively, you're getting, even if you drink a Coke, you're drink, getting mostly free water. 
So it's the same thing. Yeah. I have one question. You know, you mentioned about beer versus water, and usually it doesn't cause the hyponatremia. Then I saw beer protomania. It can, it can cause it, though. So, okay. I was just wondering about It's just less common. There. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest with you, if you drink enough, you can drink water. It's like too much, it's like a PCA. If you take too much of your PCA, what happens? You fall asleep, right? If you drink too much, there's only so much beer you can drink without falling asleep. I mean, so people can't do it 24 hours a day like the polydipsia patients can. So they have to, they have, they pass out or fall asleep or a combination at some point. You know, every day they have, you know, chronic alcoholics get into this routine or they, they drink for a certain number of hours, they sleep or pass out and they get up and, and drink. But the chronic water patients, especially if they're psychiatric patients, a lot of time they're not sleeping, you know, four or six hours a night, they sleep two hours versus even the patients that are, you know, drinking, they may not be asleep the whole time, but they may be not drinking beer for six or eight hours a day. So it gives their kidneys some time to catch up. That's true. I mean, it's, that's why it's not as common. Plus it has a little bit of sodium in it.